Welcome, AP Chemistry students, to Unit 6, Introduction to Thermochemistry. Thermochemistry and thermodynamics are technically two units in this course. In this unit, we'll introduce enthalpy. In Unit 9, we will talk about practical thermodynamics, where we talk about how we use the laws of thermodynamics in order to do work. Unit 6.1 is an introduction to enthalpy, or the heat of a reaction. So energy is the ability to do work. And in eighth grade, you learn that there are two types of energy. Energy of motion, known as kinetic energy, and potential energy, energy that's stored. Now, kinetic energy, energy of motion, is related to temperature. So kinetic energy and temperature in Kelvin, we're going to think of them as synonymous, that they're very close, they're related to one another. This unit we are going to focus on the stored energy. Now, in physics, in an eighth grade, you learned about energy being stored based on location, right? Your professor probably raised his keys over his head and said, if I drop them from here, they'll hurt way more than if I drop them from, say, just above your head. That is stored energy. And in physics, it's again a lot about location. However, in chemistry, the top of a beaker and the bottom of a beaker, that stored energy is relatively the same when it comes to location. So in chemistry, we are going to focus on the bonds. What about that bond between hydrogen and oxygen? What energy is stored within that bond? This stored energy in bonds is known as the enthalpy of something. And in layman's terms, we refer to it as its heat, the heat stored in a bond. But it's not really related to temperature in the way that you think it is. But we do give it the variable H. Now, the amount of energy stored in something is astronomically massive, right? From that famous formula, E equals mc squared, where c is the speed of light, 10, 3 times 10 to the 8th. So squared, that's 9 times 10 to the 16th. So even one gram of something has an excessive amount of energy. So we never really look at just the energy. We're going to look at how that energy changes. The Greek letter delta is a shorthand for change. So in this unit, we are going to focus on the change in energy. Now, as I said, enthalpy is the potential energy of something. We've already gone over potential energy in some form or fashion. In our previous unit, we talked about how reactants have to have a certain amount of energy when they collide in order to form products. The amount of energy they need when they collide is known as the activation energy. So everything in the universe has some energy associated with it, some enthalpy, that heat associated with it, and when they collide, they need to have more of it. But when they collide, if they're able to overcome their intramolecular forces, they can form products, which have some different amount of energy. So there's a change in energy between your reactants and products known as the heat of the reaction. So if your reactants gain energy to form products, that's known as an endothermic reaction, it's going to absorb that energy from around it. So endothermic reactions, we say, feel cold because they'll absorb the energy from your hands. If your reactants lose energy to form your products, that means the energy is given off. So we say this is an exothermic reaction. This will cause the surroundings to increase in temperature, so we'll often feel them as hot. So the heat of the reaction, if you have a positive heat of reaction, products minus reactants gives you a positive value, that's known as an endothermic reaction. Whereas if it's a negative value, that's an exothermic reaction. The positive and negative simply give you a direction. Is it coming in or going out? Now, when your reactants collide with enough energy and in the correct orientation, they form a transition state or activated complex. Like, let's say you have nitrogen and oxygen coming together to form nitric oxide. The transition state would be when both the reactants and the products exist simultaneously. So you'd end up with something that might look like this. <coughs> where both reactants 
and products exist simultaneously. It's a theoretical state. It's not as though you could freeze time for that nanosecond to witness the transition state, but in theory, but in theory when reactants collide with the correct amount of energy and in the correct orientation, that is the state you end up with. So here we have the combustion of ethene, and we're asked to complete the energy diagram. So, ethene and oxygen have to collide, and if they collide in the correct orientation and with enough energy, they will form the activated complex. Now, the amount of energy they need when they collide in order to form that activated complex is known as the activation energy. But once they form that, they'll make carbon dioxide and water. So here's the question, is this an endothermic or exothermic reaction? It's exothermic for a couple reasons. First off, combustion reactions, when you light something on fire, it gives off heat. So this is an exothermic reaction because one of the definitions of a combustion reaction, at least at this level, is that it's an exothermic reaction. Now, if you didn't know that, you could also have ascertained it from this right here. Our value for the change in enthalpy is less than zero, meaning it's a negative value. So, when we finish this line, we need our products to be at a lower number than our reactants. So carbon dioxide and water we can put down here. To show that the, that the enthalpy of this reaction, the difference between our between our products and reactants is negative. With that being said, you are able to do page 10 to 13. Please pause the video and do pages 10 to 13. Now this energy that enthalpy is measured in, energy being a value, has a unit associated with it. Now in the United States we measure that energy in calories, right? Like for lunch you had a bag of Doritos, that's 140 calories. Now that calories is the amount of water it takes to raise one kilogram of water one degree Celsius. It's known as a capital calories, because if you look on the bag, it's a capital C. That is not a mistake. This is because a ca the calories that we measure our diets in are in kilo calories. A single calorie is actually a very small amount of energy. A single calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. However, this system is not recognized throughout the entire world. Most of the world uses the, uses the International Science Units, or SI units, and so most of the time we will focus on joules. A joule, it takes about four joules to equal one calorie. So we will oftentimes use joules or kilojoules if we're working with something very large. When it comes to reactions, the enthalpy can actually be calculated a number of different ways. So over the next two lessons, we're going to go over different ways to calculate enthalpy, the change in uh, energy of a reaction. Does it get hotter? Does it get colder? How much does it change in temperature? That will be the subject for the next two lectures. So the first one's fairly straightforward, just simple stoichiometry. If you are given a reaction and the reaction includes an enthalpy value either in the reaction or if they outright tell you that the value of enthalpy associated with that reaction, that enthalpy, that value is the number of kilojoules for each mole of reaction. So if you thought of the reaction as one, this is the amount of energy that goes with one of that reaction. How much energy would go with two of it? Well, you're smart, you're pretty, gosh, aren't people like you? You'd be like, well, it'd be twice as much. And that's exactly how it works. So enthalpy can sometimes be put di directly into the reaction equation. So here we have potassium hydroxide, when dissolved, produces 43 kilojoules for each mole of reaction. Again, here it is a product because this enthalpy value is negative. If it were positive, it would be on the other side. So since this is an exothermic reaction, energy comes out, the reaction is going to feel warm. 
So exercise two asks, okay, how much energy would be given off by 14 grams of potassium hydroxide? We can use that 14 grams of potassium hydroxide to you figure out stoichiometrically how much how many kilojoules that would release. So we set up our factor label method. We need to be in moles in order to use stoichiometry, so we need to change grams of potassium hydroxide to moles of potassium hydroxide. So for each mole of potassium hydroxide, how many grams are there? So potassium hydroxide would be a potassium, an oxygen, and a hydrogen. Potassium is 39.1, oxygen is 16, and hydrogen is 1.01. For a molar mass of 56.11 grams for each mole. Grams cancel out, I have moles of potassium hydroxide, and from that I can use the stoichiometric coefficients. For every one potassium hydroxide, I get 43 kilojoules. So 14 divided by 56 times 43 tells us that this reaction would produce 10.7 kilojoules. How, how much energy a reaction gives off or is a, or absorbs that kilojoules for each mole of reaction is determined by doing what's known as bomb calorimetry or, or coffee cup calorimetry where we carry out a reaction in a coffee cup. The coffee cups nested between one another when they're made out of styrofoam, they resist allowing energy to enter or exit the system. And so the only place that energy can enter or exit is through a thermometer. So as the thermometer gives off energy or absorbs it, the liquid in the thermometer expands and we can determine how the temperature changes. And temperature is proportional to energy specifically kinetic energy, so we can use that to, to determine how, how the enthalpy changes. And assuming pressure is constant, the amount of energy, the quanta of energy changed, is equal to the change in enthalpy. So we use the variable Q to show the quanta of heat changed, but as long as it is carried out in a constant pressure, uh, Q and enthalpy are equivalent. Now this formula might be familiar to you from first year chemistry, from honors chemistry. It's that the change in energy is equal to the mass or amount of substance times the change in temperature times the specific heat or Q equals MCAT is the way that I remember it. It is on your formula sheet right here and what each variable stands for is present. Please know though that M can be the amount of stuff most likely in mass, but it could also be in moles if your specific heat is in moles. Specific heat is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of a substance one degree Celsius. The molar specific heat is the amount of energy it takes to heat raise one mole of a substance one degree Celsius. So depending upon what specific heat you have depends on what your units of M have to be. When it comes to delta T, it's always the final temperature minus the initial temperature. If delta T is positive, that means that your reaction reactant gained energy. That would be an endothermic reaction as the heats as it heated up. If it's a negative value, that means your final temperature was less than your initial temperature, so it gave that energy up. So let's do one of these problems. A 25 gram sample of water cools from 100 degrees to zero degrees. Determine the energy lost by the water. So our formula is Q equals MCAT, where delta T will be our final temperature minus our initial temperature. They give us the mass, 25 
grams. The specific heat of water is a constant is a constant 4.2 joules for each gram and degree Celsius. So, but you will usually be given specific heat values because they are specific to each individual substance. It cools from 100 degrees to zero degrees, meaning our final temperature was zero degrees. Our initial temperature was 100 degrees for a grand total of a 100 degree drop in our temperature. So we get that the value of Q is a negative 10,500 grams cancel out and degrees Celsius cancel out, so we're left with joules, or a negative 10.5 kilojoules. In order to cool from a high temperature to a low temperature, water has to give that energy up. That's why this is a negative value, showing directionally that it's leaving the water. This problem is fairly simple and straightforward. In fact, it's taken from my first year chem course using Q equals MCAT. But if we wanted to know for a reaction, how much energy comes into or out of a reaction like we did in example two, the problem's a little more complicated, like exercise three, part B. We're doing a coffee cup calorimeter, so we're going to assume that no energy is gained or lost by the surrounding and everything is contained. 100 milliliters of one molar sodium hydroxide and 100 milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid are mixed. Both originally are at 24 degrees Celsius and after the reaction is done, we reach a temperature of 31 degrees Celsius. Assuming that they all have the same density and specific heat, calculate the enthalpy change for the neutralization of hydrochloric acid. So what does that mean? They're saying for this reaction, we want to know what is the heat of neutralization? How much energy is gained or lost when this reaction occurs? If we have 100 milliliters, of one molar sodium hydroxide and a hundred milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid, together they make up one solution. They say the overall solution's density remains one gram for every cubic centimeter, but you're smart, you're pretty, you remember from first from our first unit that a cubic centimeter is the same as a milliliter. So if I have 100 milliliters of one and 100 milliliters of another, that means in total, the solution has a volume of 200 milliliters. At one gram for each milliliter, that means I have 200 grams of solution. So with that 200 gram solution and a specific heat that's constant, for both of them, I can determine how much energy is gained or lost. You could tackle this for both of them and then add them together. However, this is one system carrying out in a single container. So the change in energy should be consistent for both of them. The final temperature is 31 degrees Celsius. The initial temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. So the change in temperature for this reaction is 6.7 degrees Celsius. Degrees Celsius will cancel out and grams will cancel out. So we end up with an energy transfer of 5,601 joules or 5.6 kilojoules for each mole of reaction. Now that is enough for you to actually do the classwork that goes with this page 14 in your packet. However, on page 14 of your packet, you may come across a problem that's a little more advanced, where you have two, two substances at different temperatures. At what temperature do they reach thermal equilibrium, where the temperature is the same for both of them? So if I have a block of lead and I place it next to a block of aluminum, and they both reach 
a consistent temperature, they have reached what's known as thermodynamic equilibrium. Meaning the energy that one gains has to equal the amount of energy the other lost, assuming nothing was gained or lost by the surrounding. So <clears throat> to do this problem, to do problems like this, we'll tackle example 3B. A a 0.3 molar block of lead is heated to 373 Kelvin. It's placed next to a much larger block of aluminum, which is cooled to 250 Kelvin. What is the final temperature of the two blocks? So our block of lead starts off hot, right? We heated it up to about 100 degrees Celsius. And then we placed it next to a much larger block of aluminum that was cooled to a negative 23 degrees Celsius, much colder. So what temperature are they when they're both the same, right? So the lead block is going to lose energy, it's going to cool down, while the aluminum block is going to gain energy. The amount of energy they gain or lose has to be the same. The only difference is the direction. One of them is going to gain energy, that's going to be our aluminum block. So we'll plug in the values of aluminum here, that will be some positive value. And our lead block has to lose energy as the temperature that it ends at is going to be lower than the temperature it started at. So with that in mind, we can actually set this problem up. Our lead block, our lead block is going to lose energy. So we can plug in that 0.3 moles of lead is going to lose energy at a rate of negative 26 joules for each mole Kelvin. And that is going to result in a change in temperature where our final temperature minus 373 Kelvin, our initial temperature. Now again, this is negative because our lead has to lose energy. Now that's going to equal our aluminum block where the final temperature <coughs> minus that initial temperature of 250 Kelvin results in a temperature change at a rate of a positive 24 joules for each mole Kelvin. And then we have 0.6 moles of aluminum. Showing that all the units cancel out and that this problem works, I'm now just going to kind of simplify things. So combining like terms, I don't have any variables in those first two, so I'll just combine them. 0.6 times 24 is 14. Now that's got to equal 0.3 times 26 is 7. And again, it's going to lose energy, so it's a negative 7. And then I can distribute into that expression. So I end up with 14.58x minus 36,000 equals a negative 7.92x plus 29,000. You might like terms to get my expressions all on the same side. Since I know temperature has to be a positive value, uh, let's put all the x's on the left and all the non-x's on the right. So I will add 7x to both sides and I will uh, add 3000 to both sides. 
and I end up with the expression 22.5x equals 65,000. So my final temperature for both, my value of x, comes out to be 293.3 Kelvin as the final temperature of both blocks. The real trick here, guys, is to remember that one of them must be negative and the other must be positive. So you need to rationalize in your head that the hotter block is going to lose energy and therefore this specific heat needs to be a negative value as it loses that energy at that set rate and the other block has to be a positive value as it gains energy at that set rate. You are now able to complete page 14 in your packet. I will see you next time when we calculate enthalpy yet another way with Hess's Law and bond energies. I will see you next time.